Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session, Meet the Pioneers of Sustainable Fashion, part of the Sustainable Development Impact Summit 2021, hosted with the World Economic Forum. My name is Holly Syrett, and I'm a, an alumni of the World Economic Forum Global Shaper Community and the Senior Sustainability Manager at Global Fashion Agenda, a nonprofit aimed to mobilize bold action on sustainability in the fashion industry. I'm delighted to be uh, the moderator today and honored to be soon introducing two sustainable fashion pioneers to talk about what's next and what's now in sustainable fashion. And most importantly, what actions are needed from both industry actors, industry enablers and citizens alike. We have a little under 30 minutes um, and we'll start by hearing from our two sustainable fashion pioneers, hearing their initiatives and projects both on the human and the environmental aspects of the fashion industry. Then together we'll be zooming out to look at the broader industry, what's needed at a global level, how to reinvent business models, and then zoom in to understand what individual actions are needed for both companies and, pe and people part of the fashion industry alike. And basically, since we're all wearing clothes, we all have um, actions to take. We invite you to interact with us. We have a Slido poll that I'll be introducing later. And for everyone dialing in on top link, please um, feel free to interact with us and ask questions using the chat function or virtually raise your hand. So to get us started, the premise of today's meeting. Now more than ever, we see that consumers are increasingly, and I prefer the word citizens to be honest, but increasingly caring about the environmental and social consequences of their fashion spending. And so to a growing group of investors who are becoming aware of the risks of not investing in sustainable businesses, um, and of course the consequences of uh, crises like the climate. Furthermore, we see increasing policies on the horizon that will be streamlining um, moreover sustainability communications, overproduction, reconfiguring textile waste streams, and requiring due diligence throughout the supply chains. Besides this growing awareness and these um, developments, we're also in an increased state of urgency. I'm sure I don't need to tell anyone on the call how the IPC has warned us against the unprecedented and irreversible chains of, uh, uh, of climate change. But what me uh, many people may not be aware is the fashion industry's actual impact. It's a substantial contributor to climate change, being responsible for 4% of emissions globally. Um, and only last year, there was a publication by McKinsey and Global Fashion Agenda on fashion's impact on climate, which had a shocking figure, namely that the fashion industry was off track to meet the Paris Climate Agreement by 50%. Those uh, trajectories can be reversed, but to understand we're off track by 50% now, action is urgent. Not only that, the UN estimate there's approximately 70 million workers in the fashion industry, and many of which are being failed by an industry that has been profitable for so long, with unsafe work environments, undignified work, salaries lower than the cost of living, something has to change. So that's what we'll be talking about with our two fashion pioneers today. And as I said, I'm truly honored to be introducing Safia Mini, MBE, founder, uh, uh, MBE uh, and founder of People Tree, and also Real Sustainability Advisor, who's a Schwab Foundation social innovator, and Javier Goyeneche, who's the founder and president of EcoAlf from Spain, um, and also a Schwab Foundation social innovator. Thank you both. I'm absolutely delighted to have you today in a, a whirlwind session. I'm sure we could spend much more time together. Um, Safia, I would like to start with you. You founded People Tree in 1991, truly a pioneer in sustainable and fair trade fashion. You're known for a sustainable materials. If I'm not mistaken, we're the first certified world fair trade organization fashion brand. I've done remarkable collections with the likes of the Victorian Albert Museum and BBC Earth Collection. Besides that, you're also a published author and uh, in your last book touched upon um, on modern slavery and how uh, with the topic slave to fashion. Can you start us off with um, explaining how the fashion industry has evolved since you um, since you launched People Tree and how the brand has evolved with it? Well, thank you, Holly. Thank you for the for the question. Well, I, I think there has been you know there have been positives in that we have now we we, we have enough answers to know that we can produce fashion sustainably. 
the the industry, if you like, uh, has an ecosystem uh, where, you know, un, un, unlike where we were 30 years ago when I started in Japan, developing the first organic cotton supply chains and certifications, we do have now an infrastructure. We do need to innovate um, much more strongly. Um, I think the, the sadness is that in 30 years, we haven't reversed the trend at all. We've increased uh, production and consumption of fashion by 60% just by the, the year 2000. So we need to reverse that trend. Uh, so it will be a question of, of the kinds of innovations that we're going to be discussing today, but it also is about looking at the elephant in the room, which is looking at degrowth. So you have seen in one way positive trends of this ecosystem evolving, more materials being available, but actually no no shift in the, the biggest issues that are at, that are, the fashion industry is played by. And can you share with us um, why you shift to your uh, latest initiative that I believe touches on both the climate ecological aspects of the fashion industry? Yes, well, I think many business leaders have been um, re-inspired, reinvigorated by um, Extinction Rebellion and the school strikes in 2019. We set up Business Declares and we've put together a network of, of people sharing best practice to decarbonize, to really take into consideration um, social justice as we uh, look at a just transition in, in business. Um, my, I've been working on a, a new book called Regenerative Fashion, uh, which is looking at all of these multiple pathways to creating a, a future that works within planetary boundaries, uh, but, but creates, if you like, um, within the context of donor economics, um, that, that sweet spot where we do fulfill uh, the needs for livelihoods and to put food on the table for those millions of people that are involved both in the fashion industry and who are impacted uh, by the pollution at the moment um, of the fashion industry. Uh, we're also putting together something called Fashion Declares, which is uh, a network of uh, of people within the fashion industry who are looking at sharing best practice, uh, putting pressure within their companies uh, to hold their management teams accountable uh, for that decarbonisation and for that just transition uh, within their businesses. So that's going to be launching in January. Um, it's, it's similar to many other uh, professional networks like Architects Declares or Doctors or Music Declares uh, and we'll be launching um, in, in January, as I say, uh, next year. So, yeah, I hope people will go onto the Fashion Declares website and, and sign up to uh, the mailing list. But I think, you know, we know that we need to work together. We, we don't have time. Uh, we, we cannot afford the trajectory of fashion increasing to maybe as much as 25% of, of, of global greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And that's the trajectory that we're on. And we just have to take out, if you like, this prop of the fossil fuel industry, which is creating the synthetics, which are, uh, you know, which are responsible now for the, uh, the microfiber shedding, which is, is, is creating the most incredible pollution for both aquatic life and human health, uh, at the same time as generating through the agriculture and, and um, sorry, the uh, the, the pesticides and um, and insecticides, uh, the most colossal damage to uh, both in the context of, of climate change and uh, phosphate and nitrogen uh, loading. So I think there's this, this, this urgency to really shift. Fossil fuels are responsible for 89 percent of greenhouse gas emissions. You know, how do we take out fossil fuels from the fashion industry? How do we move to regenerative agriculture? How do we move to putting small scale farmers and even artisans and, and, and craft manufacturers central to create social, uh, social impact and social justice? Uh, so that, that's very much the area that uh, I'm looking at now, um, having, having built and, 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 and worked with the people tree model, which I can see um, has you know, very, very great advantages. We need to really scale that way of thinking throughout the industry. Thank you. Oh, there we go. Sorry, I was muted, but hey, uh, thank you so much, Safia. And you really set us up wonderfully to bring in Javier and to hear more about how you set up EcoAlf with this mission to um, use 
uh, and cherish resources in the fashion industry in, instead of creating virgin ones. Would you um, help us understand how you've approached that and how I believe you're not only a fashion brand, but really a material development organization? Mm, well, to be honest, we are a fashion brand. The thing is that when, when we launched the company in 2009 and we decided to try to create a sustainable fashion company, we believe the most sustainable thing to do is to stop using natural resources in a careless way. So recycling could be a solution if we were to make a new generation of recycled products with the same quality and design as the best known recycle. The problem is that when I went to the market in 2009, there were no cool recycled fabrics. Uh, the fabrics that existed were recycling a very small percentage and they were not very fashionable. No? The textures were not very good. So we had to start developing fabric. We have developed over 540 different recycled fabrics from different types of waste. And uh, it's, uh, it's in part of the DNA of the company to develop materials, to develop filaments, to, develop, to work with companies around the world to make um, improvements. No? I think um, right now, uh, well, I think I said it very well. I think fashion cannot just be about looking good anymore. No, it also has to do about doing what is right and feeling good about it. I think um, what you do is not enough. I think how you do it is more and more important. Not anybody can make a T-shirt, anybody can make a shirt, but what does what what footprint does that T-shirt leave in the world? Or what that uh, shirt? No, and I think here it's. Um, it's many, I think we have many issues. I think, of, of course, we have the circularity issue, which is, uh, for me, one of the biggest challenges. And that starts by eco-designing. So at the beginning, designing teams need to understand, they need to design to be able to uh, put that shirt again into the system in, in, in time, no? Um, I mean, they, they call us a lot at eco to, to give talks around circular economy, and I always say the same thing. We're not circular economy until we're not able to transform all the garments we make and again into filament and again into fabric and again into another jacket, we won't be circular economy. I think uh, microplastics, as uh, Sophia said, is also another big challenge. But also, we, we, I think we have also a huge challenge with, um, with education. I think we need to start changing the way we consume. I think uh, that's one of the biggest issues. You know, when we go to universities you know, and we give talks to young people and they they are very much into sustainability and they want to be really sustainable, but at the end of the day, they want to keep on wanting to, to buy 20 T-shirts of five euros per year. I said, that's not possible anymore. You have to decide. And they always say, what do we do? I said, we well, buy less. You don't need 20 T-shirts. Okay, you have to start buying less and buying with more sense of responsibility. So I think, um, because there's not going to be enough natural resources. I mean, we're 150,000 more people in the world every day. We're going to be two more billion people by 250. There's not going to be enough forest to keep on burning, to plant cotton. There's not going to be enough water. There's not going to be enough landfills. There's not going to be enough natural resources. So we have to change the way we consume. So I think we have a lot of challenges between companies, between consumers or citizens, and, of course, people who legislate who also have to start taking action. Exactly. So we're talking about all of the different actors in this circular fashion value cycle that need to come to action. And I'd really like to talk more about what this industry can look like and hear your definitions of, of, of what the future industry must become. Before that, um, Javier, I'd love to hear more about your um, project to capture ocean plastic, upcycle it into materials. So I know that's something you founded in a, a small way with just, I believe, a few fishermen, but it has really scaled across the industry. I think it would be really interesting for our audience to hear more about that initiative. Thank you. Well, we, we, we had been recycling discarded fishing nets of Nylon 6 for many years. And, and one day in, uh, I think it was end of 2014, I was in a port and one fisherman said, Javier, you should come out and fish with me and see how much waste gets caught in the nets every time we pull up the nets. So I went out fishing with him, and it's true. Unfortunately, every time they pull up the nets, mixed with the fish, there was a lot of waste. So we decided to start a project. We convinced three fishermen from the east coast of Spain, of a little port in Alicante, to let us put a little container in their boats. And all the waste that gets collected in the, in the ocean, put it in the container and take it to the port instead of throwing it back to the ocean. Um, what started with three fishermen, now it's over 3,400 fishermen in Spain. 
mean, I spent like every Thursday for a year going to a different port, waiting for the fishermen to come from fishing, inviting them to a beer, and convincing them to start uh, taking the wage with us. Then um, we were contacted by the government of Thailand to help them replicate this in Thailand. So we've been there going for three years, helping them replicate this in Kotao, Samui, Rayan, and Phuket. And now we have a quite ambitious goal, which is try to replicate this in all the Mediterranean and work with over 10,000 fishermen <clears throat> by 2025. So we've we've signed the first 16 ports in Greece. We've signed the first, well, we've already signed one in Italy, about to sign five more, four in France by the end of the year. And the idea is to see, see if we can do a beautiful project with people from fishermen from France, Italy, Spain, Greece, Croatia, Turkey, Egypt, North of Africa, in, a, in an amazing cleanup project, which we're not going to clean the Mediterranean because unfortunately um, we're taking right now around 200 and something tons per year out of the ocean. If, if we manage to do this, it will be probably near 1,000 tons. But there's, there's, there's a track of 16 tons of waste getting into the ocean every minute. So this is uh, more about creating awareness than really uh, putting a, a final solution to the problem. Mm -hmm. And it's an appalling statistic that you shared what goes into the ocean, but also inspiring to hear how you can um, get two flies with one stone, basically, by both being able to clean up to a certain degree and reuse those materials. And I think, um, uh, wasn't it you that said waste isn't waste until you waste it? And see, how can we both redesign the model so we're taking waste streams or stopping waste from going out of the industry and seeing how we can recapture it? Um, to be honest, Sophia, you... that, 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 that sentence is not mine. That, oh. that phrase is from Will I Am, the singer of the oh, Black Eyed Peas. Okay. okay, well, we'll credit him accordingly. Thank you, Will I Am. <laughs> um, Sophia, you talked about your initiative to bring together different players in the fashion industry and collaborate. Can you um, both share with us how you feel about pre competitive collaboration? Um, how can we bring together different brands, manufacturers, maybe other innovators to collaborate? And how do you see this future industry coming together? How do we decouple the prosperity of the industry from the growth? Um, and what are, your, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, well, I think there already are um, some fashion initiatives. You know, we have the Global Pack, we have uh, the, uh, the uh, Global Fashion Agenda. I think um, what, what's lacking is, um, if you like, the uh the 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 energy and the communication from everybody within the fashion industry because we, we know that it isn't enough just to have uh, some progressive corporations and and um you know small innovative brands like Javier and uh, and my own you know that that we need every business to change or we uh, or and we need uh, regulation and policy and standards to be put in place so it chokes off the laggard so it chokes off those uh, that are putting profit before uh, the environment and and people and and the, the the prospects of future generations we just need to share best practice and to be open with it to really treat it like an emergency so there is i think i mean i'm i'm, I'm hearing from um whether it's leaders within apparel in in supermarkets or in luxury fashion whether it's in the so global south or it's in in high income nations i'm hearing a really really strong set of voices that want change they want to work together they want to know uh, what what workers need they want to know how to to reduce their water footprint or or how to to procure low impact and preferred materials um, but they also kind of need the tools to be able to go into their business and say you know hit, there's a climate emergency how do i get management to act like it's a, an emergency where is the climate plan what are we doing against the climate plan and so it's having some of those those practical tools uh, also, um, to, to empower people to take those discussions uh, within their company and to, to, to drive that agenda within their companies. Now, if you have, if there are people who are dialing in today, you think that's exactly the issue that I'm facing with, where should they start? What tools can they find? Uh, well, the first thing to do is to, to go on to Fashion Declares. Uh, as I said, the platform's launching in January. Sign up to our mailing list. 
uh, when we launch, um, that the, the tools will be there. You'll, you'll be, um, be able to get involved with it straight away. Um, you can also go on to Real Sustainability, which is a resource for sustainable living and leadership. Um, and um, certainly by following me on, on Twitter or LinkedIn. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. And Javier, how do you um, collaborate with your peers or um, throughout the sector? Do you have close collaborations with your manufacturers, for instance, um, to work on these different types of um, approaches? Well, absolutely. I think, um, I mean, I mean, and right now I'm in Portugal because I, I came yesterday to work with uh, uh, with, man, with 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 partners, which was when making um, filaments, was making fabrics, manufacturers. I think today you need to be very, very, very close to all the supply chain because, uh, especially if you want to have total traceability, you know, from uh, in our case, from the waste to the final garment. So we we need to work with all these supply, chain. and I think we need to work uh, all together because we need to go fast. So I think the way to go fast is to, to, to work all together, to share know-how, to, to share experience, and uh, uh, then we're going to move really fast. No? And, and, and you can see it now that over the last two years, I think there's people trying to move uh, faster and faster in, in, in the good direction, and I think collaboration is key. No? In any case, I always say the same thing, no? that um, at the end of the day, the big change is going to come when the big players decide to, to take this really seriously. No, I think this is not about doing a capsule collection, which might be sustainable, and then the other ninety-five percent. No, I think uh, I think the, um, it's the big players who have the resources, who have the volume, who have the teams, who have the capacity to make this change uh, as fast as we need. Hmm. I think that's really interesting because one aspect we're talking about, how can we reduce the scale of the fashion industry? To Safi's point, there's, there's, there's more innovations, there's more awareness, but we're still scaling and that scale can't work within planetary boundaries and has to be um, turned around. At the same time, you're saying we need to scale innovation. So it's how do we, how do we make the industry smaller, but at the same way, increase innovation that's available. Um, what, well, what I, needs I think, to be scaled? Is it? I, I, I Go think ahead. The, the I think the, the the problem is, you know. It, I mean, it's the, the economy stupid, isn't it? I mean, it is just a totally dysfunctional economy that has been for the last decades and decades, and and now we're finally calling it, aren't we? We're saying that we need systems change, but but we 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 can't. We, you know, we have to work with this imperfect market economy because we can't. We, you know, we need the speed. So, a carbon tax. You know, if we if we simply look at a carbon tax on oil, you know, seventy five dollars, that would change the the, the two thirds of synthetic fibres that come into this industry. Those that are, you know, we, we cannot be burning uh, virgin oils. Uh, we cannot be using virgin polyester. You know, this is what's driving. The, the greenhouse gas emissions. This is what is driving the micro shedding um, and, and, and polluting our, our, our waterways. Uh, that tax would make such a difference. Also, if one looks at, for example, uh, cotton, conventional cotton growing, not organic cotton growing, conventional cotton growing, you know, that is oil-based synthetic insecticides and fertilizers. You know, we've, we've got regenerative agriculture beginning to be played with by food companies and by some te textile companies. You know, so that transition would make the difference. We have to reduce production and consumption of, of fashion by, by between 75% and 95%. I mean, you know, we're not talking about let's let's just snip a bit off, you know, the 5% here or 10%. Or we're talking about a radical reduction. But we can do that in a way that supports farmers, in a way that supports makers, artisans. We can do that and provide work. You know, we do that at People Tree in, in many respects when we have a handwoven product, the, the, the percentage of labor in the, the FOB price can be as high as 30%, not 3% or 4%. So we can find livelihoods in the global south and more locally, because we are going to be localizing fashion also by these fantastic initiatives like Javier's 
uh, piloted and, and, and mainstreaming. So we can also, with fibre shed projects, we can also look at locally produced um, fibres and, and, and materials and, and, and with that employment. So I do think this contraction of the fashion industry is first seen as a negative, but actually it's an enormous positive. We just need to get out of that old-fashioned growth mentality that has caused the problem. Yeah. And so, Javier, do you have anything to add in our last minute left? Well, I absolutely agree with everything Sophia is saying. I think... Um, uh, I need. I think we need to change many things, and the business model of fashion is one of them, which uh, has to be redefined. No, I think we uh, we have now the. Well, I don't, I don't know if it's now, but, but but definitely now we have the opportunity and the responsibility to redefine a business model which is not working, um, because you cannot have. A, business model which is about buying throwing buying throwing and you trend every thursday discount promotion black friday that's creating a huge amount of millions of garments going to landfill which nobody uses and that you know, each of those garments uses a lot of natural resources and water and chemicals and emissions and and uh, that's that's what's not working it doesn't matter if you make those garments with a sustainable fabric it's the waste you're creating, which is the, it doesn't work. So some people think just because you use a sustainable fabric, you're sustainable. Well, no. I think yeah. it's many more decisions you need to make. I mean, you cannot support overproduction. You have to start. Uh, um, you cannot support continuous promotions and discounts and Black Fridays and all these kinds of things. I, th I think we 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 have to well go back uh, and redefine too many things. And, it, and it's actually lovely to start treasuring one's clothes, you know. Um, it, 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 it's, exactly. it's, it's wonderful, isn't it? And, you yeah. know, if we start to understand that uh, even, you know, even a, a, a single T-shirt costs 2,700 litres of water, two and a half years of drinking water for a person on the planet when we are under water stress, you know. I mean, it, it, it's that piece of education that we really need to start uh, to, 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 to promote, I think. Thank and you. children, Thank children you, by the way, when you go to school, children, children understand those things very easily. Um, it's, uh, it's fantastic how they understand them, no? And uh, that's what we always say at Ecoalf, no? We spend a lot of time worrying about what planet are we going to leave to our kids, and we should be much more worried with what kind of kids are we going to leave to the planet. And, uh, and it's all about education. I think it's, uh, it makes a big change.